Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to Exile and Bookbuild's Authors on Tap reading series. I'm Javier Ramirez, and along with Kristen Gilbert, who's in the other room, we run this beautiful space at 410 South Michigan Avenue, Suite 210. Tonight, we have a wonderful event in store for you all, one that we feel super lucky to have been offered to us, and we still can't believe it. Uh, Exile VIP Matt Bell will be in conversation with songwriter extraordinaire Josh Ritter. Matt has written a couple of really great novels, my favorite being In the House Upon the Dirt Between the Lake and the Woods, as well as a short story collection. His writing has appeared in the New York Times, Tin House, Conjunctions, and many other publications. Matt was a finalist for the NYPL Young Lions Award in 2014. And I mentioned that because last night we hosted the winner of the award this year, Catherine Lacey. Mm. So it's been a rare week of young line sightings here at Exile. Matt is here to discuss his new multi-layered and incredibly epic apple seed with Josh Ritter. Josh, Josh is, as you all know, an accomplished singer-songwriter. Bright's Passage was his first novel, and we are all looking forward to reading his new novel, The Great Glorious Goddamn of It All. I just like saying that, mm -hmm. uh, which is mm -hmm. set to come out on September 7th. Before I get out of the way, I just wanted to let everyone know that you can now buy books directly from us from our fancy new website. Just go to exileandbookbuild.com, create an account, and start ordering to your heart's content, including multiple copies of Apple Season Bright's Passage and the great glorious goddamn it all. You can uh, pre order that from us. Those of you in the audience are encouraged to keep your cameras on, but stay muted until the QA portion of the event. When we reach that point, you can either use the raise hand function and uh, Josh will call on you or get the message relayed or type your question into the chat and we'll do the same. Uh, and Josh will ask those questions of Matt. Yeah. Signed book plates will come with each pur purchase of either of our guest books tonight. So I'm gonna get out of the way and hand it off to my, Matt and Josh. So have a great show guys. And thank you so much for being here. Really, this is a pleasure. We're so excited to hear what you're gonna talk about. Yeah. Have a good show. Thank Thanks Javier. Thank you. Wow. Hi, Josh. How are uh, thank you? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good. I'm so good, man. How are you doing? I'm good. It's so nice to see you. Thanks so much for uh, for doing this. Oh, I'm so I'm so excited. I I I'm like I I want to I, I I there's so many things that I want to talk to you about with with Apple. So I want to say thanks to Javier and Beth and Kristen and the whole Exile staff. Everybody, thanks for for having us. Um, mm -hmm. This is uh, this was. Uh, Matt, a, a, an amazing, an amazing book to read. I, I, I had an amazing time. Uh, it was, uh, it's ambitious. It's, uh, it's, it's poetic. It's, it's, it has such, it has such uh, sunlit qualities about mm -hmm. it. And uh, it's so uh, uh, like, I, I would say like, it has so much, uh, it's, it's so kind of sensuous. Uh, some of the sections of the, the, uh, of the, of that, that, that you, that you, the, the language that you use it's so beautiful and I, I i i i wanted to talk kind of beginning with uh so uh, a a section that I, I thought was really gorgeous and i wanted to talk to you about about ohio as, as a as a place yeah. i want to talk to you about like ohio because like you have ohio uh, three you have kind of three iterations of ohio in, in this in this novel you have the ohio of of the of the of the very early 19th century, the late 18th century, and you have Ohio of the of the of the near future, and then Ohio of a thousand years from now. And I wanted to talk to you about what is the essential kind of Ohio that 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 we that we can like that we can like sink our teeth into like an apple. You know? Oh, it's such a good question, and I, I you know I. Uh... I grew up in the Midwest, uh, but in Michigan, uh, and you know, had some family in Ohio. I went to grad school in Ohio in, in Bowling Green, and so spent a, mm -hmm. a couple of years in sort of northern Ohio. Um, you know, and I think it's it was sort of interesting to to learn about historical Ohio, which I didn't know that much about. Um, I think the historical period in the book, in some ways, is like um, like this mythic idea of like the Midwest before people in my mind, certainly before like uh, colonization. Um, I know even when I was a kid, like backpacking and hiking in Michigan, we did a lot of camping. My parents are camping in Michigan right now. Um, I always sort of like pictured this, like what it would be like before there were people or cars or highways, you know, and sort of this uh, imagined 
sort of version of, of it that it probably is not what it was. And then as I, I started writing the book, um, I became really interested in the ways that it had been transformed by people, um, that even the sort of nature that I feel like I grew up with was transformed in certain ways. Um, one of the things I didn't know about until I started researching this was uh, like in Ohio in the 1850s and 1860s around the Civil War, they were already like restocking like deer in Ohio because they'd all been hunted. There were like no wow. deer left. And so some of like that Midwestern sort of nature that I grew up with and think of as like essential to the Midwest also had an element of like, like nature preserve, <laughs> hunting preserve. Um, and uh, <laughs> I think that was interesting to sort of think about and to try to understand um, and then thinking about it in the future in some ways is about kind of the loss of what was there. There's the, the part in the book, as you know, where there's sort of like the list of like Ohio animals, the animals that live in Ohio now. Absolutely. And just trying to hold on to like every little thing that's sort of there or in any of our places and try to um, know them and name them and to see that as uh, essential to the quality of that place, if that makes sense. Absolutely, that's so that's so interesting and beautiful. But the, 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 I think it reminds it puts me in mind of of, of driving uh, along some of the the big highways of the of the, you know through through Pennsylvania and Ohio and the kind of the especially this time of year the lush greenery that grows to either side and the forest looks impenetrable you know mm -hmm. for 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 twenty yards or so you know and like this how how we kind of like compose a myth of, of wilderness around us. And and I, I I so that's that's and and so so one of the one of the uh, the so there's this this idea of, of of Ohio as this canvas for the story, and, and then you have uh, another uh, another element that I that the which was uh, 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 Chapman um, or John Chapman or, or or as we know Johnny Appleseed and 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 we we see. We see uh, this uh, this story told through, I guess, what you would say, like kind of iterations of of, mm -hmm. of Chapman, yeah, and and I was wondering if, uh, if if there was something you you make this this absolutely uh, a just beautiful uh, decision at the very beginning of the book, which is that Chapman is a half man, half animal. He is like a, a like a, 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 a ferian trope or whatever that like a, 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 and, and he's like he and and he's he's half kind of cultivated human uh and half uh a kind of pristine nature and i was wondering like can what what drew you to to can you describe him and can you like tell me what drew you to to these sets of qualities in, in yeah kind of i think person. absolutely thank you um, you know, I think the the initial sort of prompt for the book or the the idea that got started was this idea of retelling Johnny Appleseed as like a, a fawn or a satyr from like Greek mythology. Um, and so that was sort of the original image. You know, I sort of saw uh, like that furred hand planting apple seeds. And I was like, oh, that's great. That'll be fun to write about. Um, and so it kind of started from that. Um, but the the having the the half human, half animal sort of character and having um, a foot, uh, I want to say hoof, I was making a bad pun, I'm going to make it and pretend I'm not making it, um, <laughs> in both worlds, um, felt real, it just opened all these other doors kind of instantly, you know, sort of giving a character divided loyalties, right, the way that he's sort of drawn to both places, um, the want to be human and the want to not be, um, which I think is not, you don't have to be a fawn to feel that, right, I mean, I feel like that's a, a feeling sure. a lot of us their identification with nature, your want for, for sort of wilder, wilderness or wildness, um, and then sort of like also wanting to be like a person who lives in a house and has a job and, you know, does these sort of things. Um, and that just, sort of, that, that sort of gave me like a, a lot of places to go once I had that. Um, and weirdly, the sort of iteration through time happened pretty quickly. Like it changed a lot. Like I didn't have the, the three timelines during the book initially, um, but I had the idea that it would move through time pretty quickly. Um, and maybe some of that was that I, I didn't know how to set the whole book in 1799. But I think also it just seemed like some of the things I was writing about felt very present to me, like in our time, and that finding a way to sort of draw them through seemed important. Absolutely. I think that there's something beautiful about the way you fold time. I really appreciate how how people use like a deal with time in a novel, mm -hmm. uh, you know, because because we can extract so much from a single instant. 
and we can also like as you do at one point uh fold 10 years mm -hmm. and 10 years can go by in, in a paragraph and, and and i i think that that's 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 so like like beautifully beautifully done there was there was there was something about uh i found that like that the chapman as 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 a fawn was like you know like growing up near goats and and mm -hmm. and around goats you know they they are they, they are such a, a perfect animal for uh for uh um adaptability you know mm -hmm. as as and they and 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 and, and they they're so stubborn they're so uh cantankerous mm -hmm. and I, I i thought that that was that that was beautiful and i i i wrote at one point that that the writing that the the language that you use really it almost does caper it almost mm -hmm. like moves dances like that and, and i was wondering if maybe you would like read a little section from from the beginning yeah thank you so much i think um uh, yeah. I'm really drawn to this idea of Virginia Tufts where she talks about a uh, syntactic symbolism that like a sentence can move like the action that it is. Um, and I, I'm really yeah. can't do that all the time, but I like that idea in my head, right? That there's sort of like the way you build the sentences can reflect the action or somehow feel like the action. Um, so it's good if it felt like that, I feel really happy about it. It um, really yeah, absolutely <laughs> does. It's amazing. Uh, <laughs> Um, so I'm just going to read a little bit from the from the beginning of the book, um, so you don't really have to know too much about it, except that this is Chapman in 1799 and his brother Nathaniel um, arriving in uh, in Ohio, coming from Pennsylvania to begin another season of apple planting. Um, okay, thanks, Josh. Chapman wakes in the cold and the dark and the wet pre-dawn slush to the sound of his brother Nathaniel already up and tending to the sputtering ashes of last night's fire, cursing and shivering, huddled beneath his only blanket. Despite Nathaniel's ministrations, the coals beneath the ashes stay dead, the gathered wood wet, breakfast impossible. Shelling himself out from his bedroll, Chapman rises to, offering his brother a grunted good morning before stamping his cloven hooves against the frigid ground, trying to quicken blood sluggish with sleep. As first light breaks, he stalks silently away from their campsite, climbing the last ridge line of this Pennsylvanian mountain pass to watch the night's rainfall trickle off into morning mist, admiring the fine accidental melody of clean water falling branch to branch. A moment later, dutiful Nathaniel follows along, dragging their bags and tools to where Chapman waits upon his outcropping of rock, one clawed hand raised to shield his golden eyes as he surveys the forest they'll cross today, snowpack still jamming the forest shadows, sparkling ice coating its swampy glacial petals and its irregular lakes, all this waiting beauty backlit now by the red shroud of sunrise, the new day's dawn setting aglow, a vast world not yet fully explored. This brother, Nathaniel says, placing one calloused hand on taller Chapman's bare brown shoulder, waving the other out over the territory below. This is where we'll make our fortune. Pointing out the first landmarks that are due to pass today, he traces a path out of this mountain gap and down to the slim strand of tilled earth that gives entrance to the Ohio territory, then the way beyond into the unsettled, unmapped forest swamps of the interior, past the river bottomlands and sheltered ravines where they sowed last year's nurseries toward the next uninhabited acres where they'll aim to plant this year's seeds. As Nathaniel happily details his plans, Chapman smiles his much practiced smile, his sharp teeth slipping from behind his broad lips. Look, brother, he interrupts, pointing out dim campfires barely visible through the morning mist, flickers of flame and smoke rising in far off sheltered dales. There are so many more of us this year. Every year, these fires move deeper into the landscape, each one a distant sign of strangers come to expand the human mark to put the land to what Nathaniel has taught Chapman are its rightful uses. Here are settlers hunting and trapping and gathering wild foodstuffs, cutting down trees and tearing up rocks to make room for placeholder farms, making way for the towns to come. While others tap trees for sap, 
and hang tin sugaring buckets over hot coals, sometimes passing the time with amateur fiddling, the inviting sounds of their instruments carrying across even the most desolate, starless, moonless nights. Together, the brothers measure again the increasingly believable potential of this territory, its wilderness cleared by war, then emptied by treaty. As he has at the start of every other year's journey, Nathaniel tells Chapman again how this taken land can now be brought to heel by industrious men, how by many hands the foundations of a new civilization will be laid here, the land year by year made ready for the coming of more people until one day the uncultivated earth gives way to what he says will surely be the grandest of cities, each graced by the tallest buildings and the widest avenues, all populated by an endless parade of hardy settlers planting horizon busting fields of wind tilted golden grain, harvesting fruitful orchards planted by these two forward thinking brothers. Chapman and Nathaniel and these others gathered around their distant fires are only the first to come, he says. Even if our industry should fail entirely, Nathaniel concludes, surely we will not be the last. Nathaniel has said this for 10 years now, the same lines recited from the same mountain pass at the outset of each year's venture. It's time to go, Chapman says, suddenly impatient with his brother's story. He ties his bedroll and his tools over one bare shoulder, slings his leathern seed bag around the other. The morning air is chilled and damp, but the bark of his skin keeps him warm enough that even in winter he wears no shirt or coat, only a pair of trousers hacked above his inhuman knees. He dusts the last of the night's frost from his flanks, then whinnies lowly, stretching tall to rub the smooth shells of his curved horns with his clawed hands first his broken horn and then his intact twin for luck. Nathaniel laughs, then mimics his brother's superstitions, rubbing his own bare temples, where just recently a few gray hairs have started creeping through the brown. Meet you at the river, Nathaniel teases, sidestepping onto the narrow trace path leading down the ridge line, if you can catch me. He rushes to build his slim head start, but his advantage doesn't last. A moment later, Chapman surges past him to drop down the steep plunge of the mountainside, his hooves sliding precariously on loose scree as he picks up speed, the joy of moving fast filling him from the inside out, his fur standing on end, his heart leaping with happy effort. He quickens his pace with every step until a barking cry rips free of him, the sound of his voice foreign enough to this territory and every other to frighten all the nearby roosting birds into sudden startled flight. The gray sky filling with their black silhouettes, their many cries joining the whooping of this one fawn returned at last to wildest lands. I'll stop there. Uh, thank you wow. so much. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Mm. Thank you. That's that, that was that's so beautiful and like in in the in the 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 sense of like uh, uh that that you have uh during the sections of uh of chapman the, of of the landscape as a, as a as an idyllic place and as as a place filled with with uh with with in kind of infused with uh, with so much myth that, yeah. that 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 chapman can't even escape uh chapman is like surrounded by myth he's he's per you know pursued by it mm -hmm. and and i think that it's w one of the things that 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 i, I i've been thinking a lot about uh, uh because of apple seed is is the idea of utopia and the american idea of utopia uh, uh you know uh, the johnny Appleseed came around at a time when 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 we had well, i think we were thinking we could perfect all sorts of things mm -hmm. whether it was the soul or 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 or, or the work day or or or, or the landscape and and uh, and I guess I, I wanted to ask you, you know, what what do you think? Do you feel that that uh, uh, how do you feel uh, um, Chapman is uh, uh, rep is is representative of 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 kind of the uh, American I, I, uh, the push against uh, cultivation? Is he is he, he uh, at this as uh, because at the same time as as he was traveling into the wilderness and, and cultivating it by planting these 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 orchards with his brother, uh, you know, he was also kind of uh, 
pulling it away from the wilderness that that he was born into uh so so yeah i think that's great i think um uh it's it's i don't think i started out this book thinking about utopia but i definitely ended it thinking about it like as i wrote right like i think it like weirdly became more of a utopianist writing a book about climate mm -hmm. change which feels like maybe an odd odd thing but i think it it did make me think that there was like more work to be done in that way and more thinking to be done in that way um one of the things you know like central to like the word utopia or the original like thomas moore kind of utopias is there's always someone who's like left out right that's like the failure of utopia is that it, like is exclusionary that's it's a, it's defined in some ways by who doesn't get to be there um and thinking about the ways in which uh a, a perfected america or a perfection a perfect american economy or society or politics has often been sort of defined by exclusion or or something that's lost um even in in this book sort of the human versus the non-human like a, a perfect human society that has to wipe out all of the things that we're living in this place to, to exist is very imperfect from my sort of point of view, you know. Um, I think it was interesting to to realize that um, Nathaniel could be this sort of avatar for manifest destiny in a certain way. He could be a guy who like really believes it for most of the book um, in a way that makes me uncomfortable. Like that speech he gives at the beginning about all the like hardy settlers. I mean, like um, every time I read that part, I get a, I, I can feel it. I get anxious reading it. I feel like I need like a, a warning before it. Um, but I also remember, uh, I mean, that speech sort of comes out of traveling with my my dad, who is a, a hunter and environmentalist and, and cares a lot about like natural places, um, but also has more manifest destiny like in his heart than I have, right? Um, and we'll go mm -hmm. hiking here in, in the mountains around Phoenix. And, you know, Phoenix is such a sprawling city in a place where maybe there shouldn't be 4 million people, um, definitely shouldn't be 4 million people. And we'll climb a mountain and he'll look out and he'll go, one day this whole valley will be filled with people. And I'm like, no, I'm like, please, no, like, let's not do that, <laughs> um, right? But it's interesting, and, and like, I get like upset when he's talking about it. He's like, wait, I don't understand right. what you're upset about. And I'm like, no, no, like the worst thing would be like for there to be a house mountain to mountain here. Like that's, and yeah. we're like hiking through the natural part he wants there to be houses. And it's like, I don't think he really does, <laughs> right? It's just, they're like, they're but they're competing stories. He sort of believes both which is we should preserve well, natural places and we should make humans as productive and bountiful as possible. And they're, but they're contradictory, right? Right, right. And I think you do such, such, a, such an amazing job playing that over, out over the course of, of a thousand years and how, and how trying to make things better and, and more uh, trying to make things more uh, productive without any sense of of uh limit only only ends up kind of dissipating them and, and making them s lose their kind of lose their like their original wildness and their original mm -hmm. hardiness which is like mm -hmm. you you use the apple tree all uh, as 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 that as the as the as as the symbol for that and like the and the, the kind of the, the apple tree and the and the and the, the fawn I, I i wanted to ask you about uh your writing as 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 uh how do you how do you how th this is something that I, I would really love to know is like when you when you when you know the things you know and the and and have done the research and that you've done and, and the writing that you've done and 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 looked in, looked at the places that you you needed to look and you you've come back with all this this these dire things mm. there's so much there's so much there's so much dire uh, prognostication about what's what's going on and what's happening right now all around us. How do you how are how are you able to to write? How does it how are you able to sit down and do it? Like I, I what how do you, what do you tell yourself? Because it's it's something that I feel like we all would love to know. Yeah, thank you. Um, there's maybe like a couple parts to it, right? I think one is um, uh, I'm going to sort of butcher what she said, but my my friend Amelia Gray one time talked about like. Um, like writing not being a way to like escape your emotions, but to like confront them, right? To like go toward your emotions instead of away. And that that being sort of a useful, good thing to do. That if you're just trying to get away from them, that wouldn't make good fiction or wouldn't make good art and wouldn't be the same thing. So there is a way of just like moving toward the thing that bothers you. Um, there's like the write what you know kind of uh, advice. And I think like write what you're afraid to know is also like really useful, right? Like this sort mm -hmm. of like mm -hmm. to move toward the thing you don't want to know about. Um, we talked on the phone the other day and I was saying like, um, 
Uh, I think it's a little bit like when you're you're sick, you don't want to go to the doctor, and so you're just nervous about it all the time. Then you go to the doctor, and they're like, "This is what's wrong with you," and it's terrible. But you're like, "Well, at least I know." Um, mm -hmm. And I think so. Some of it was that. I I do also think that um, one of the things I I was very nervous and, and angry about climate change, and still am. But I also felt like the solutions are sort of known. Like, it's like, you know, I mean, like the wheel is absent. Like people have been studying this for a long time and thinking about it for a long time. And the, the critiques and the solutions are not, it's not like we don't know what to do. It's just whether we're going to do it. And so like those questions are sort of different. Um, the, there's, yeah. there's nothing for us to do. I no longer feel at all. Like I, I feel absolutely like the, the things we could do are possible. And they're, they're, the sooner we do them, the more possible they are. Um, so then it's a question of like will as opposed to like how and why as opposed to what or something. Um, so I think that was actually, that actually made me feel better. Like I was writing about something that was solvable or doable if we chose to do it. And then you could write toward that. Um, and then I think the other thing that's animating, I hope animating the whole book, but animated me writing is uh, really trying to capture my sort of wonder toward the world and wonder toward the natural world and both are like this is what's being lost but also like this is what exists you know um mm -hmm. i live in the suburbs of phoenix which is not a place that people think of as like nature rich and it is though right and you see like phenomenal mm -hmm. beautiful mm -hmm. things in nature every day even without the part where i go out to the desert you know um and learning to yeah. sort of I don't know, wonder is the reason you save, you want to save the world. Like the world is wondrous and, and important and that makes you want to do the things that we know we should do. And so trying to create a sense of that or an experience of that in the book was like a reason to write. And also just like enjoyable to try to do, you know, writing those nature passages sure. in that first chapter and stuff is like, um, yeah, I, th that was part of it. And there's always a sense of like play, I, right? As you know, like animating your writing is like, yeah. Yeah, the the play part of it is important. It's not. I didn't sit around being grim every second of it, right? Like it was like no. so fun in a in a different kind of way. Yeah. Oh, that's so. I I I think that's so interesting. How 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 uh, writing about writing about something or or like or, or like painting or something, whatever allows you to 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 get a, a to to really get a, a closer look at, at what is actually composing the. The yeah. picture is is is, mm -hmm. is 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 phenomenal. It, it, uh, I was um, I, we 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 talked a little bit about uh, about uh, brotherhood and and uh, and I, I wanted to like I wanted to, to 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 talk to you about that because there is Nathaniel and 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 Chapman, but there's also the 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 brotherhood that I that I feel is 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 goes across these uh, uh, these these uh, many eras and, and unites these these different iterations of Chapman. There's there's something about them that uh, that 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 really made me feel as if there was a a, a family at work here. Mm -hmm. You know, and the you know that, that Nathaniel and Chapman were the first, but then there was there was uh, there was there was later on there was there was. Uh, uh, John's John's uh, family that he that he that he chose to to spend his life with, and, mm -hmm. and then then there's uh, then uh, with C four thirty three there's there's the 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 inhuman world that is kind of surrounding him that is like the vestige of the old life. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know. I wanted to ask you about brotherhood. Yeah, I um I. I think, you know, one of the core relationships in my own life is with my, I, I have four siblings, I'm the oldest of five, you know, but my, um, my brother who's two years younger than me and I are, are really close and we're, we're very, very close growing up. Um, we're so close when we were kids that I have memories that sort of don't work because I can't figure them out. And what the solution to them always is that like my brother Nick was there. And I've sort of like, mm -hmm. used, but it was like remembering that there was like oxygen or sunshine. Like I'd like, like he's almost mm -hmm. like missing from the memories because he's so present, right? Mm -hmm. um, right? And so I think that sort of relationship between brothers is really sort of central uh, to my life. And so realize, you know, writing about Nathaniel and Chapman was a, a way of writing about that. And um, their conflicts and the way they come together feels really important to me. Um, in an early version of the book, uh, Nathaniel kept coming out of the book. I couldn't figure his character out. So would be like, I've got to get rid of this guy. And I, there'd be scenes like with no brother and scenes with a brother. He kind of haunted the book in like early drafts. So I wasn't sure if he existed. Mm. I'm glad Nathaniel stuck around. 
Um, and then there's a lot of found families, right? It's like who you choose to care about and who you choose to be. Like the mm-hmm. resistance group in the second storyline is, is a found family. It's the people who care about the same thing, trying to do something together. Um, and they have complicated feelings about each other as families do. Um, I think there's a lot of caretaking, if that makes sense. Like, I think that's like a central yeah. relationship um, between humans and then between C and like the tree that he's caring for. There's just this like, the things you choose to have responsibility toward or the people you choose to have responsibility toward, the beings you choose to have responsibility toward feels really um, central and important to me. Well, you have a, you have a really interesting uh, 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 way of, of talking about caretaking uh, uh, versus this uh, kind of large scale kind of geo geo shaping of, mm-hmm. of the world you know and there there is caretaking there is like there is the the uh, the, the 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 growing the apple tree and planting it and getting the getting the seed from the from the pumice and like and, and get pulling it from the bag and planting it in the soil and then there's there are the super orchards that are mm-hmm. uh, you know that are and and, and i i i um and, and, and these and these kind of the uh, this uh, agrarian world gone 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 uh you know sterile right i don't know i think it's beautiful oh, uh, thank you. Um, uh, let's see i wanted to like like i i wanted to i grew up near um uh, near uh dorshak dam which was a uh, dorshak reservoir uh and uh i was i was drawn by something that you had said where you had had said that 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 you were you you were inspired uh, by somebody uh, who who had said like every day that they decided they had to decide between writing and, and bombing a dam and they would right. they would they would pick up the pen and write again. Uh, could you could you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah, I uh, it's in a, a Derek Jensen book called a, a Language Older Than Words that I probably read in my early twenties. You know, I think um, and it really stuck with me. He was he had written a couple books about uh, dams killing salmon in the Northwest, and you know, sort of these sort of activist environmentalist sort of books where he um, passionately cared about salmon and want you know the dams were not built in a way they could get up river to spawn, and and. In that book, I think really starkly, he sort of says, uh, more or less exactly what he said, just like every day I wake up and I could either, I could blow up a dam or I could work on my book and I work on my book. And um, and he's conflicted about it, but also like most of us aren't going to be, you know, uh, environmental terrorists probably. Um, so, you know, like I think the choice most of us make is is that. Um, and there are people who are of more activist leanings, you know, I think um, even in non-destructive, non-sort of violent ways, like some people are given to activism in ways that other people aren't in a direct way. Um, but everybody does the thing they can do and you hope it's sufficient and you hope it's enough and you hope it matters. And I think that hoping it matters is like the other part of that. Like, you know, that Derek Jensen book I read that in was at least his third book about the salmon, right? You know, there was sort of a, mm-hmm. I think there was a futility to it to him as well. Um, uh, oh. that he was trying to fight against, he was trying to like not feel that the work he was doing didn't matter, you know, but I think you square sure. that all the time. And I think, uh, you know, getting to write about things that matter to you, I guess I'll say this, it's hard to know, like, we, I wouldn't write a book about these issues if I didn't think it couldn't do something. That would be ridiculous mm-hmm. or bad use of my time. Um, but I think, um, oh, I've sort of lost my train. Um, no, it's. I, I'd say I, I was going to say that the the most the most one of the one of the things that that I was curious about uh, as like in in reading Appleseed was that you know it's 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 a hugely I mean I, I can't stress it it's so ambitious it's such a it, it spans so much like time and the language is so is so beautiful and 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 and, 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 and it's a free flight of imagination in some in, in, in and then and then uh, and then it brings you back to a solid idea. I, I I'm I'm curious, you know, how, what's your what 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 is what do you do in your day for for to, to write <laughs> a, 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 like a book like this, like the, like this ambitious and, and 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 how do you how do you how do you how do you kind of like eat eat this elephant? Right, yeah. right, right, right. Um, <laughs> before I do that, I remember what I was trying to say the last one, so I'm going to say that real quick before I leave. Yeah, yeah. Mind, which is. Um, I think uh, one purpose a book like this can do is 
first for me as a writer, it's like to think your own thoughts and to feel your own feelings to figure out what you feel about something has a value in a culture that wants you to like accept the story the culture is telling and just mm -hmm. sort of buy into that and move on. So that by itself is like the reason to write every day. It's just to find out what like you really feel and spend time with your own thoughts and feelings, you know, as, as I'm sure is the same for you, both writing and making music. Um, and then the other one is like, if you can make an experience for other people where they can do that, that the book is, this is a very like earnest, like, here's how I feel about this book, but yeah. I hope it's not like didactic, yeah. right? And that a person no, can no. feel room to feel and think on your own in it. And that that has value, even if the dams are still there, you know, like there's sort of a, right. Okay. <laughs> you're, you're so right. I think, I think that's like, I, I one of the things that I fear in, in songwriting is that, that the song will ever try to be instructive. Right. I never want to be instructive. I want to be like entertaining and, and like, and the idea to be, to come in there as well, but like, you know, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I think so, yeah. um, like if you tell people a good story about something that matters and you let them sort of think and feel as they go, like the rest of that stuff will happen. You know, I mean, I think one of the things I had to learn maybe early on in writing was that I, I go through in a, you're talking about day-to-day -day stuff. I go through at some yeah. stage in a book draft or a story draft and I highlight everywhere I've explained something and then I try mm. to take it all out. Like I just try to like rip it out if I can. Because a lot of the explanations wow. are like me talking to myself. I'm figuring it out as I write. And so I'm like, well, this is what this means. Or this is what this piece of dialogue means. Or this is what like this symbol is. And then I really believe that the reader like does not want your logic, like as the author. They want to like uh -huh. do that connective work themselves. And so like the experience or like the getting to play along happens in those gaps. And if I just like pull my experience out of the book, the reader then can have theirs. Um, I think that works so a lot of the time, you know, I think that's part of, I mean, maybe it'd be better not to write that explanation in the first place, but I, I think on the page, I'm a, I'm a writer, right? So, um, right. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's sort of transition yeah. from my experience to theirs is really important. Um, that's and, so true. Yeah. Uh, okay. As far as like day-to-day -day stuff, um, I mean, I think a really important thing to me is like a teacher of writing is like the, the task of writing a book day to day is like never to write a book right like that's just not the job when you sit down you're doing this like very small thing usually um often very small right I mean, like the day-to-day -day work yeah, yeah. can be silly what it is um i think you know some really simple things like always trying to work on the part that you're most excited about always trying to do the thing that sort of has the most energy um a really useful idea i learned from uh from my friend uh, Natalie Bacopoulos, who I think learned it from the novelist Charlie Smith, you know, the sort of game of telephone we all play with this like craft sure. stuff, um, is uh, she talked about like writing the islands, like you write the parts you can see, like you don't save anything for later. So like, you're like, I want to get to this scene in 300 pages or a thousand pages or whatever you're doing. And it's like, write that now and believe there's more good stuff waiting once you get that out of your head. Um, and so my first drafts look very exploratory and very sort of generative. And it's just like, make things that interest me today. And then I'll, I can sort of shape later, figure it out. Um, so there's a lot of like uh, exploration and bloat probably, and you know, things that won't end up being in the book, um, but they're all part of that sort of process. Um, right. Yeah, I think if that makes sense, I think very sort of That's so form early drafts. Yeah, I think that's so. Do you, so yeah, and and and, and and that works so well with, with with what you're what 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 you're what what you what you end up coming coming to the table with, which is this. The, it feels like each 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 section that you that you pick up feels like you're you're dropped into the middle of this uh, of this thing that's that is moving and yeah. and, and always changing and and. and 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 and, and w it, which is so uh, it, 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 uh, powerful when it is like a, a novel about big ideas to also keep the thing uh, uh, bouncing along the current. Yeah. you know, is, is really is really impressive. I really oh, thank you. Wonderful. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. Um, one of the the things that was uh, one of my goals maybe for learning. I I've always thought I wasn't a very good dialogue writer. I'm not sure I'm a great dialogue writer now, but I always felt like it was the thing I was least good at. And so one mm -hmm. of my like aesthetic goals for this book was like to learn to write better dialogue. And um, and it really this is such a 
dumb sort of on the page thing, but in previous books, I had not used quotation marks around dialogue. I sort of had like a uh -huh. Cormac McCarthy kind of dialogue tactic. Um, sure. I was like, I think I'm going to, I'm going to give the quotation mark a try and just like learning how to use that again after not using it for like 10 years, like <laughs> right, yeah, right, right. Faster, it was like, it's like, I mean, it's such a dumb, <laughs> stupid thing. Right. And it was just like, Oh wait, if I write dialogue this way, I can move like way faster than I'm moving right now. Um, and it, yeah. and figuring that out changed the pace of my scenes um, in a way that is great. Um, so I don't know. I like the kind of McCarthy-esque, no quotations, very like prophetic kind of dialogue, but switching to the dialogue I'm using this book, allow people to discuss ideas and also change the pace. Um, right, I, I right, really right. think that's the big difference in pacing between this book and other books of mine is like the dialogue. That's Changing that's account. fascinating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like that's but it is, and it is so. It is. Uh, it, it, do you do you uh, do you find that like that uh, that the language itself has a has a rhythm when you're when you're writing? Do you uh, do you and do you do you do you also move between uh, um, kind of uh, between like using a longhand or or the computer mm -hmm. or does that change how how you how you write? Ninety percent, like on the computer. Like I, I just have, mm -hmm. I've just partly, I just have terrible, unreadable handwriting. I'm, uh, I'm mm -hmm. typing in changes on a nonfiction book right now, and I'm like, what do I mean here? Like I just have no idea what my handwriting mm -hmm. is saying. So it's mostly on the computer. Um, but I, I, you know, as far as like working the language, like obviously, like the ideal at the end. Um, Gary L. Lutz' uh, essay, Sentence is a Lonely Place, which is sort of real foundational for me, talks about Susan Sontag's idea of uh, lexical inevitability. So like a sentence mm -hmm. at the end should feel like if you changed anything about it, the sentence would be worse. Like that's how you know when you're done, right? Um, and well, you're yeah, yeah, trying yeah. to get, I mean, right, like a low bar, right? You're just trying to do that. Um, <laughs> and uh, But like it never reads that way when you're drafting it. Like every day I'm trying to do like the best, pros I can do. And I, I mean, it all has to be revised. It all has to be changed. Like it's nothing gets done at the first time, but, but I also think, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, like the play with language is like the central thing I, I love, right? Like making a good phrase or making a good sentence, like maybe even more than I like telling a story. Um, and so on days where I have no idea what I'm doing, it's like, at least I can play the language, you know, you sort of have that like yeah. ability to sort of play the music of the sentence in that way. Um, that's really beautifully said. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's so well, that's that's uh, the, the, and I have two other things that I wanted to ask you about, right. like, what, the, the, what the, when, when we, it, when in, 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 in your book, the, the future is, is, is really dealt with as like, a uh, uh, the idea of the future is, as kind of this, uh, uh, it's almost like a, a siren song. It's like a song mm. that 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 is sung that that everybody has to listen to, uh, and is undeniable and 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 leads the characters kind of onward. Like, what do you do? You think that that uh, that that we do we have a kind of an unhealthy view of the future as being a place that's going to save us, or 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 do you do you have a, like more of a uh, what, what's your what's your idea of, of, of the future, you know, as as a as as a, 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 a in this book? Yeah, I um, I. I think about halfway through the book, I, I had this sort of like it's in the book better than I'm going to say it, I think, because that's how writing works. But I think uh, I had this sort of formulation that I, I came to understand about maybe just like capitalist organizations in general or sort of like, you know, sort of like corporations and universities that work for. And when you were dealing with people in power, there was always this like, the past is irrelevant. Like the, the promises we made in the past don't matter or the way things were done in the past don't matter. And the present is like a sacrifice or you're sacrificing in the present so we can arrive at this good future. And so the future is this like promise, like we're, we're gonna get there and you're gonna like, maybe you're suffering or struggling now, but in the future, you'll get this payoff. Um, and then the things we told you we would do for you in the past, you should not think too much about. And it felt like that kind of promise comes up a lot in politics and in work and in, and in different sort of institutions. Um, and so I think that's part of the relationship to the future. Like you suffer now, the future will be, this is definitely my Catholic mm -hmm. altar boy coming out too, right? Like it's sort of like, like <laughs> suffering here, heaven there, right? Um, yeah, yeah. But I think that we get that promise a lot. 
And then the other half of that, which maybe is what you're really asking about is like, in the future, we will have the technology that saves us. In the future, we will have the, the everyone will get everything. Like it's unfair now, but it'll be fair later. Um, you know, I was just listening to a, a, a Pod Save America podcast and they were talking to a, an organizer of uh, uh, black voters who, you know, obviously like were so important to Biden getting elected. And she was saying like, if you're not gonna, you know, these things that are being taken from uh, especially minority communities voting rights wise by Republican governments right now. And you're saying like, we came out for you now and you you won and then you won't protect us. And it's like, and then you're gonna want us to do that again. And it's like, how many times can you like defer the future for someone where it's like, just mm -hmm. keep doing this thing, the future will arrive for you. Um, I don't think we believe that as much as maybe people did in the past, maybe because the future also feels dangerous or foreshortened in a certain way. So we both like, does, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, it's a weird, we have a weird relationship to the future right now, I think maybe. Um, I, so yeah. I, I had a feeling, I had a feeling when I was, when I was reading your book that in the, in the section, the, 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 the middle section is, is based on, uh, on a character that is not too far in the future, but I kept on projecting him much farther into the future than, 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 and I felt just probably to make my own self comfortable. Absolutely. Wouldn't it be great if that was in like the 2400s yeah. or something, right? You're like, oh, we have so much time. Exactly. Um, instead of being like, yeah, our, like my, I don't know, kids, but like my nephews would be alive during that part of the book, right? You know, um, yeah, I exactly. might yeah, do things yeah. really well. <laughs> yeah, right, 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 right. Right. I think that book takes that part of it. I never thought of this till right now, but I think, uh, I would be like 99 in that storyline. Like I would wow. definitely still be like a super old guy knocking around there. I kind of feel like I would be dead then too, which might not be true. So that's terrifying. Thank you for teaching me that. I have a, a couple questions, which sure. I'd love to read for you. The, the, uh, um, this is a, so the, somebody says, uh, Matt, your work often finds characters imposing themselves on their environment in various ways, mm -hmm. like the cartographer attempting to change the world by mapping it, Kelly seeking out the useful parts of condemned houses while trying to justify his own worth. Um, uh, do you find that you consciously return to this theme, uh, this kind of, kind of character versus world dynamic interest you more than protagonist versus antagonist stories? Yeah, I think that um, that's a great question. Thank you to whoever asked that. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Um, I think uh, we all try to shape the world to our wants, right? And I think like I'm really attracted to characters who try to like bend the world to themselves as opposed to accommodate themselves to the world, right? Uh, that sort of um, a person who wants to control the world in a certain way. Uh, the protagonist of my first novel, like one of his, his like, basic flaw in some ways is that like he wants to like control the world around him. he wants to control his family to make it exactly what he wants as opposed to like accepting what it is um it's yeah I think that's absolutely I'm very very attracted to that um and maybe again because I couldn't write dialogue I couldn't write stories in which like people interact with each other so people had to go out and interact with the world I think that's <laughs> I was like maybe I can't write any more books where like a guy wanders around by himself in a landscape and hurts them. Um, so uh, well, yeah. I, 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 I hear where you're coming from there. I, I've yeah. done that <laughs> you do, right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, but, <laughs> a good bit of that, right? <laughs> like, uh, yeah, but totally. I do think yeah. that wanting to make, just wanting things to be the way you want them and not caring what that costs, it seems very central mm -hmm. to, to characters I've written. Yeah, that's a great observation. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, that's... Um, uh let's see let's see uh, um let's see i want to make sure i'm doing this right is it, am i getting this oh let's see um this somebody uh uh somebody said uh um uh uh one of one of the things uh, the uh, favorite annie dillard quote one of the things i know about writing is this spend it all shoot it play it lose it all right away every time do it do not hoard what seems good for a later place in the book or for another book Give it all give it now and i think that's beautiful that's i i i i i, I remember uh you know that 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 some sometimes you know on, on stage i i think you know th there's a moment when 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 the mood has to change and you just know you have to change the mood and it, everything has to to shift and right. uh and and do you find that when you sit down in the morning or whenever you sit down that you you are uh performing in a way 
Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's a weird thing because the performance is like delayed, right? It's like it's going to hit mm -hmm. like four years after you do it in a way that's that's kind of odd. Um, but I think so. Like first for me, right? I mean, like the first person to amuse yourself, like you're, you're trying to make something that sort of moves. Mm -hmm. you. Um, one of the one of the last things I do before I, I turn a book in, um, which in this case was like send it to my to my agent, is I uh, I read the book um, uh, end to end aloud in the, in that sort of draft, you know. And and part of the reason to do that is like you know to catch some things that could be a little better at the last minute because you can't skip anything when you're reading aloud. But some of it is just like I I do believe in like the acoustics of language and the felt like the way the language hits you in the sort of body. Um, and it's also like your last chance to perform it for yourself, right? And just to be like, it's, it's right now, it's mine. No one else has seen it. And I get to have this last experience of the whole thing in this sort of, I mean, it can take a couple of days to read a book, right? Like it's sort of like no, allowed, yeah. it's sort of a weird thing. You're like, you're like my wife will come home, like, what'd you do today? I'm like, I read my own book to myself for eight hours. It was lovely and weird, you know, but like, it is lovely and weird. <laughs> <laughs> you're having this big bottle experience you know and like if, if you've done it well like you're so bored with your book in some ways by the time you get there but there's also like there is still stuff that like moves you like mightily in your own book yeah you get it you forget it's there or you forget how it works you're like oh that's gonna work on other people that worked on me after being the person who wrote it for three years you know um that's i think so that's great and I definitely, because I wow. care so much about like the acoustics of it, I do think of it as a heard thing, right? Like someone's going to hear that. It's going to, it's going to yeah. hit a, a languagey, acoustic sort of way. That's 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 so true. I think uh, I, 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 uh, yeah, I, I, that's uh, that's that's. I was I was I was I was I made a note that I wanted to ask you about that. There's a, mm. the the um, the, the uh, uh, let's see. I wanted to ask one last sure. thing, which was about uh, in 1893, I, uh, this Frederick Jackson Turner and saying uh, he, he was like, uh, he, 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 he was at the, at the Columbia Exposition. He, he, he said that the, uh, the, the, the frontier was closed mm. and, and, uh, you know, the, 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 that our, that our, our, our idea of ourselves as, as Americans was you know and, and I guess as people uh, was shaped by the idea that the frontier was always out there waiting was always there to be explored uh, you know is you know we've just had these billionaires go to space right uh, I, you know that's that's certainly a frontier although it is one that most of us can't experience is there a frontier right now that 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 you feel is still left for us to explore and that we can explore you know, you and me, all of us together. Right. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I mean, um, I feel like I want to say something really like pithy about like the post capitalist frontier or something like we just all go live yeah. there, you know, which maybe we should. Yeah. That'd be great. Yeah. Let's do that. <laughs> um, but, uh, but I don't know. I mean, it does feel like we're constrained in that sort of way. There is like that. Maybe I'll say this a, a really foundational thing to me in the book was really early on. Um, uh, uh, I think I, I learned this from a friend of mine, Will, Will Chancellor said something to this effect, was talking about like, there's a period before which people cannot conceive of our kind of environmentalism or our kind of um, worrying about the natural world because they, they didn't know that things would run out, you know? Um, uh, Thomas Jefferson sort of famously did not believe in extinction. So like he, they showed him like woolly mammoth fossils. He was really interested in the woolly mammoth, but he was like looking for it. Like one of the, you know, like he wanted people wow. to like find the woolly mammoths that were in America because nothing that existed could not exist. Um, right. And so in the era, you know, 1799 when Chapman's story starts, they can't even, they can't conceive of the exhaustibility. Uh, there's always more land. There's always more water. There's always more trees. There's always more animals. Um, but like I said at the, at the beginning, like by 1860, 60 years after that, we're restocking the Great Lakes in the Midwest. Like there were no fish left. Um, there were no deer in Ohio. Like, I mean, you had to put those things back. Um, and so like that's not been true for a long time, but I think it took us a long time to sort of reckon with the, the limits of the world and the limits of, of sort of nature. Um, Jeff, uh, one of the, the central sort of metaphors of this book is uh, the sacrifice zone in the West, the sort of West of the country in the future part, near future part has been sacrificed so that the other half of the country can sort of live. 
Um, and that's a term from like mining, like when you blow the top of a mountain to mine it, that's the sacrifice zone. Um, and Jeff Bezos today or yesterday when he went to space was talking about space should be our sacrifice zone and we'll put all our heavy industry in space and then we'll live here in paradise. And I was just like, oh, you know, like, here we go again. Like guys, just like, <laughs> some other, is there a frontier? I don't know, but there's another sacrifice zone. Um, and that is a really bummery last answer, but, <laughs> no, that's, 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 <laughs> but it that's, might be the case. Thank like, you. Look, for, look for another thing to despoil is not great um you know and uh and we should be wary of people who tell us like we can have our lives with no cost because we'll ruin this other thing um and we should know that that's a false argument um as the frontier i think was too because obviously people lived in the frontier the frontier being closed was uh 1890 is wounded knee that's why the frontier closes that's the last it's the end of the treaty era um it's not we're not out of land we just that had ended um so yeah, that argument is always really about people and places being exploited as far as they could be. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, Josh, this is a sad, weird end, you know? <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I, I really appreciate that. That's like, I was like, I really thank, thank you so much. What a phenomenal book. It was like, wow. it was just so, so, so gorgeous. And, 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 and I really appreciated the chance to, to, to read it and really appreciate the chance to talk with you. Oh, such my pleasure. And hopefully we'll get to do this again when your book comes out in the fall. I'm really excited to read it and talk to you about it. Oh, yeah. Can't wait. Yeah. So thank you again to Exile. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, of course. Um, it, if you had more, there's no limit here. If you guys have oh, more questions to, yeah, yeah if, totally. if you guys want to stick around for more, we, we're here. We're, we just poured a new cocktail. So, <laughs> uh, oh, fantastic. If you guys want to stick around. Yeah, I'm happy to answer questions. Yeah. Well, well, I, I, fine, I, yeah. I would love, I, I would love to like ask some a couple of people have written and ask him that but like if there are any authors or books uh, that that essentially were like that really helped to like uh, the, inspire is a word but like yeah just to co tell every the story coalesce. Uh yeah for this book um you know I think uh lots of people obviously but I think a really central person for me was was Ursula Gwynn. Um, I've just actually spent the last like week writing a, an essay trying to get at some of that. Um, so hopefully I did. But uh, about half of this book, I, every once in a while I do this project where I try to read like all of a writer in a year, you know, kind of a major sort of uh, writer with like a body of work behind them. And, uh, and so in 2018, I read like 26 of Le Guin's books um, spread out wow. through the year, just sort of, did, you know, I mean, she wrote, wrote like 50. So like, I could barely scratch it to some extent. But um, but I think. I learned so much from, I was about halfway through Appleseed when, when I did that, but it, it taught me uh, some of how to advance a idea through, through dialogue. And there's certain ways she writes dialogue where people are chewing an idea or advancing an idea that was really helpful to me. Um, we were talking about utopias, like Le Guin was a utopianist even, but yeah. not Pollyannish, right? Like she sort of like a total clarity of the world as it is. And then also like wanting it to be better. And I found that really inspiring. So she was really important to this. Um, uh, environmental philosopher, Timothy Morton has a, an idea of, uh, he calls the hyper object, um, which is a hyper object is something that's dispersed, so dispersed in time and place, you can't see it from any one location. Um, so like nuclear wow. waste would be something like that. Like it's gonna last for, you know, 500,000 years or something. Um, so you can't really know it in a spot. But climate change is that, or capitalism is that, or, or some of those things. And so th that was really, I knew that before I started the book or knew those ideas and they were animating in certain ways. Like thinking one of the reasons to tell a thousand word story was to try to um, pull, uh, pull time across in that way, or sort of to depict these ideas about manifest destiny or, or climate change over a period of time, instead of like um, one weekend somewhere where climate change happens, you know? Um, to try to have a longer mm -hmm. timeline. Um, so those two were, those were really important. Uh, I mean, lots of other writers. Uh, I think uh, Cormac McCarthy says like the ugly truth is that a novel is built out of other novels. And I think like that's like deeply, deeply true for me. Like without like a constant influx of good writing, I can't, I don't even really want to write. Like if I'm not reading well, I don't mm. write at all. Um, there is always a like reader response part of my process.
Yeah. Do you do you find that when you're when you're reading that you that you are are, are wholly engaged as a reader, or, or or do you are you do you find that you're rewriting stuff that you read? Do you do are you a, are you like a? I think I'm pretty good. Does it you wash know, over you? Say, yeah, I think so. I always hear people say, yeah. especially well, maybe there's a caveat to that. Um, I always hear people say that like studying writing made it hard for me to just read. And like I'm a pretty engaged reader. Like I I'm, I'm uh -huh. in you know. Um, it's hardest with like other like contemporary writers in some ways like but that's mm -hmm. that's about I don't know being a person in insecurity in comparison or something right you're like is this sure. am I writing a good book these are the books people are writing I don't feel that when oh, I read no. older books yeah so uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, yeah. yeah I think I get into the dream pretty well I, I have not given up my reading joy for being a writer which I'm very very happy about do you find that you have to like uh, do you do you go to any other uh, kind of artistic outlets when you when you're when you're writing or do you does 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 writing satisfy uh, all your uh, yeah, I wish I was good at something else. I feel so jealous that you're both like an excellent novelist and an excellent musician because it seems really nice to have more than one thing. Um, this is pretty <laughs> much what I can do, you know. I you know, I I I cook, I'm like really involved, like I really love cooking, I really like work at it and try at it. So I think that's a place that's like different that is a similar mm -hmm. kind of artistic thing um we were we were talking joking about my like terrible guitar playing during the pandemic um, but even that just like doing something with your hands that feels like generative that isn't in any way writing or good it doesn't need to be good for me um is kind of great um i really think uh it's really important to have high stakes and low stakes stuff and like artistically sure. And the novel writing is like pretty high stakes. I can see Emily at the top of my box yeah. nodding, right? Like you've got to have yeah. these like these things. And when like all the eggs are in the novel basket, it's good to have anything else that feels like you did something, but it's not, your life doesn't depend upon it, you know? Um, oh yeah, oh yeah, I totally agree with you. Yeah. 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 And I, teaching I, is probably part I of that. Like, I love teaching yeah. writing. And I think like that's a place where my own writing isn't the thing that's on the block but I can do good work and I can think well and, and try to be creative and, and successful there um, without it being the same thing. It's sort of to have an art that maybe is about me and one that's not feels good, you know? That's, that's so, that's so interesting. Yeah. Yeah, totally. I, 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 I used to try and run uh, to long distance running and I always found that I was like, one thing that made me feel really good about it was that I was really terrible at it. Yeah, <laughs> I was like not good, you know. Like there was nothing about it that was like I was never going to win any like awards or or or, yeah. or look too fancy going down the street, you know. Yeah. Uh, like like yeah, it's super important to be bad at something. Like it's like really yeah, the, yeah. or to have real like I have a, have a, something that the where you like you said like the stakes are are are, are lower so that you can go on these high flying, like uh, kind of yeah yeah. So thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Oh, thank you. I really yeah. appreciate it. If we do one more, I see Amanda just raised her hand. Is the first hand? Oh, yeah, totally. To get her in. Yes. Hey. Hi, Amanda. Hey. Hi. I was so excited when you mentioned um, Virginia Tuft because it's yeah. one of my favorite my favorite writing books ever. Mine's right here. I, I was wondering. <laughs> uh, I, I just, yeah, I always have it near. Um, so I was wondering since you mentioned. Uh, the syntactic, uh, syntactical symbolism, syntactic symbolism. Yeah. How do you, how do you get that to happen? Right. Somewhat, <laughs> I mean, somewhat naturally, maybe, of course, in revision, you, I'm sure right. you work on that, but does, does having those islands that you mentioned, those, those actual maybe things that you're seeing in your mind make your sentences tend to be more active in that way or I don't know I mean I think I maybe I like you said I think a lot of it happens in revision right it's sort of like you see the opportunity and then you sort of aim for it um I think most maybe you know what yours is already I think most of us have like a default like sentence length or sentence construction like my ideal sentence is 500 words long and has a semicolon in the middle like i would just write only <laughs> get away with it. Um, <laughs> i'm like I, you know there's something about just like two big ideas sort of leaned against each other that's like my thing um i think my first novel has like one sentence without a comma in it i mean like i just like my sentences lope in a certain way um and 
in revision, you know, like I, I really have come to believe that like what makes style seem good in a book is usually sentence variety. And so like, I'm usually looking to like change that up or, and so some of the opportunity towards syntactic symbolism might be just like, what's this paragraph about and what's the best way to make that felt? And so like sort of looking like, you know, maybe a couple long sentences, then you like jam a short one to like do it, or maybe you move to fragments because this is is more fragmentary thing. There's a lot of things in Appleseed I think that are suspended against each other. They're not they're not acting on each other. So there are a lot of like semicolony kind of things leaning against each other. Um, so maybe looking for like those kind of things. I wish I could just do it. Be like I'm writing a person running. I'm gonna do it this way, you know. But like it just you know um, some of it's just studying other people's sentences. Uh, one of my favorite kinds of sentences is the. Uh, one that expands or contracts in a certain way. Um, there's a, a Joan Didion sentence I'm not gonna be able to do off the top of my head, but it, it has like a, a three parts. It's like memory does this, memory does this, memory does this. So it's like three verbs. And like the first one is one syllable and the second one is two syllables and the third one is a phrase. And I just feel the way that like that opens. Every time I read that, I'm just like, oh, like look at the way that like, you just feel the deepening of that thought. Because, because the clauses are longer than each other in this specific way. Um, so just remembering some of those things exist is sort of useful. Um, I revise with the Tuft book a lot. Like I just like go through it and find like, oh, that's a kind of sentence I don't usually write. And then I'll go look for a place I can change one to it. Um, so it's kind of a nice revision prompt. I'm so glad you know it. It's just, it's the best, yeah. I can't believe it's out of print, it makes me sad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everyone should find one I'm in a used bookstore on the internet and like stash it away. So it's good. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you, Amanda. <laughs> That's amazing. That's good. That saved awesome. us from ending on my grimness. That's, that was good. You know, we can just be excited. <laughs> um, no, thank you so much. This was really fantastic. Well, thank you. Man, I, I really appreciate the chance to talk with you about this amazing, amazing yeah. book. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again to Exile as well for having for having Absolutely, Exile. yeah. Can't wait to see the beautiful. Oh, this new was place. fantastic. We can't. Yes, yeah, thanks, so I can't excited. wait for both of you guys to come see. Yeah, we'll go see a show together. Um, right. This was this was fantastic. I mean, we when once again when we were approached with this event, we couldn't believe our luck, and it exceeded all expectations. Uh, we could have gone for another hour, I think, um, especially with yeah, questions definitely. Uh, like the one from Amanda. Thank you so much, okay. Amanda. Uh, so both books here we have them in the store you guys have a few of you have already purchased wait our, do that again javier so i can take a picture i gotta get my like oh uh, sure there we go <laughs> 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 you gotta have the event photo thank you sorry now go back go back to telling people they should buy them. <laughs> yeah buy buy many copies the, the, the holidays are right around the corner uh we have signed book plates for both um thank you guys thank everyone for showing up thank you for for supporting and and supporting these two amazing artists uh cheers matt uh, cheers to, to the new novel and cheers. and cheers to josh for the if in the future uh, yeah. if we don't talk yeah. uh to your new novel as well um thanks thank once you. again thanks everyone for for showing up it was an amazing event and if you guys could you two could just stick around after we sign I'd after everyone to. uh leaves the yeah. room uh just want to say thanks yeah Sounds for real great. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Have a great night. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Stacy. So nice to see you. <laughs> <laughs> Stick around, Stacy. <laughs>